uh, the hinterlands to talk about their project, the radicalization process. Okay, cool. Um, hello. Hi. So uh, first of all, thank you to Andrew and Laura for inviting us to be a part of this. It's a real big honor, and I feel like I just got my tuition's worth, and I don't go here, so. Um, so she really got her tuition. Yeah, I really then. did. More than my grad school, maybe. Uh, um, yeah, so. so okay, we, okay we're, we don't agree about anything, so, and we don't really have, we don't have uh, anything written down, so. Uh, I do, so that's well, the first thing we're not agreeing down. about. So we're going to. We're just gonna have to go with us. Uh, um, and also, we're you know we're talking about a project that I'm not sure how many people how many people saw our piece. Oh. <laughs> okay, never mind. This for those it's of you fine. who didn't. Yeah, just, great. You, more than we thought. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, maybe we'll talk about the performance. We're, I mean, so basic. We'll talk a little bit about maybe about us and yes. about our process and maybe the cycle of work. Maybe I'll start. Go. Okay, great. Um, so we've been. Uh, for the last three, we, we create performances, theatrical performances. We come from, um, our background is of, of theater artists, theater makers, uh, but we view that in a larger context. And our, our influences are much greater than that of, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're like, we're theater makers who don't really like theater very much, you know, so <laughs> is honestly the, the truth. And um, it's sort of like we just, you know, it's too late to change. You know, at this point for us. So, um, but we we've been looking at for the past um, you know six years. We've been looking at uh, theatrical lineages in American performance. So, looking at different performance forms that emerged out of the um, in American theatrical history from the the, the Wild West show. Um, which is a kind of creation of the myth of the American West, which was um, created in order to really uh, further the expansionist um, doctrine of manifest destiny, which was also the title of the performance. Um, and from that, looking at American vaudeville, which was the first attempt to grapple with a new multicultural identity in a in, in the American cities. And in this piece, we started looking at two very specific periods of American theatrical history, which was the creation of uh, the American method, style of acting, and also the birth of the laboratory theater movement in the 60s and 70s. And both of these movements uh, were tied to the radical left. So, and also came from interpretations of uh, at the time, acting styles coming from uh, communist countries in Eastern Europe. So the um, method coming from uh, Konstantin Stanislavski of Russia and uh, the uh, laboratory theater movement interpreting the works of Jerzy Gotowski, a Polish theater director from uh, Poland, <laughs> which was a communist country at the time. And then yeah. both of those theatrical forms were incredibly radical at the time that they appeared, but then both have kind of been co-opted, maybe less of the laboratory mm. theater, but um, the things that were really innovative when they first appeared have really been co-opted into American uh, theater schools and everyone it's things that everyone knows and it's really ubiquitous yeah. exactly ubiquitous yeah. so and, and the uh, and these uh, so we were really interested in how these forms were tied to the left at the time and how the the uh, practitioners of these forms were um, were active politically in different ways so and, and so listening to these other talks to me it was kind of this journey of the empathetic body and trying to as someone who was, both of us were born in 1980, someone who is growing up in the 80s to actually understand beyond the cliche into what the, these radical moments were, to feel the energy and what Lorraine is talking about of this amazing energy of Detroit and in that era. We, in growing up, I, I feel really distanced from the actuality of what that, what that energy was. Beyond the kind of cliche, you know, and, uh, and so we, we tried to employ the methods of these groups, which included the group theater, uh, the open theater, and the living theater, 
to understand these moments of time, both as theatrical movements and as political movements, and ended up focusing uh, on you know, three areas, one which uh, was the, I can show some photos. Okay, um, so yeah. you just yeah. to, we'll give you first a sense yeah. of, the, of the piece. So you can see here, uh, yeah, so the, we, we ended up focusing on a particular um, iconic image uh, for us, which was of the, uh, of the American left and what the perceived failure of the American left, which is of the, uh, um, the Weather Underground and specifically the townhouse bombing, which has um, burned into my, was burned into my consciousness um, as uh, my, my parents were kind of. Uh, Let me see if I can find that slide. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Oh, yeah, there, there we, we go. go. We're going to actually skip around. We don't, we're gonna, yeah, so. Hey. Hey, no, no, no. There, there we, we go. go. So um, this is Dustin Hoffman, but uh, <laughs> but what which is um, who uh, when um, when the three members of the Weather Underground were killed in the townhouse bombing, where a bomb they were uh, building, which they were planning on um, uh, detonating, actually in a violent attack um, targeted at at people, uh, unlike the other Weather Underground bombings, which were uh, targeted for monuments. Uh, the, the house they blew up was actually right next to Dustin Hoffman's house, so he's in most of the photographs of, uh, of this um, really um, tragic moment in the American left and what has become a, a metaphor for overreach and has become a kind of condemnation of radical action and a sort of, for me, it's become a kind of fairy tale that parents tell their children. Uh, sort of like uh, the tale of La Llorona, the weeping woman in, uh, which I was also told as a child growing up in San Antonio, Texas, which um, is this woman who if you get too close to the river bank, she'll come out at night, you know, she'll drag you down to the depths of the river. So the townhouse bombing becomes a similar kind of fairy tale of what happens if you go too far. You know, what happens if you um, decide to take um, action uh, against the United States government is, is this kind of hubris and your, your own death, you know, with, with Dustin Hoffman looking at you. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so the, yeah, the, the, like we're saying, the main inspirations for the sort of source materials for the piece are the Weather Underground organization and specifically the 1970 townhouse bombing. Um, the, the group theater, which what is the only uh, part of this? Well, actually, Antigone is not in the same era either. So the group theater, which um, came about in the 30s, and after making it big as a collective with um, communist ideals, uh, representing the working man in America, they all went to Hollywood and made bank. So, um, so we were interested in this process, you know, and, and what, um, how they went from, uh, uh, you know, radicals to um, being, you know, totally mainstream and this idea of free radicals and how, uh, and how that eventually settles and, and becomes the, um, you know, stasis again. Yeah, is, is stability inevitable? Yeah. Um, then uh, the living theater. Uh, there and on the far left. Uh, yep, a real great image of their Paradise Now performance. And, and, and the kind of repudiation of the group theater, uh, sorry, of the, yeah, of the group theater, who the living theater never uh, were co-opted. They were exiled. They, they left the country, and, they, and I met with Ju Judith Molina, one of the founders of the living theater, and who translated this version of Antigone that we used in the performance. Um, I, I was able, had the opportunity to meet her in the nursing home just um, a few months before she died in New York just a couple of years ago. And she still believed, first of all, she, I'm going to tell a story. Can I just tell the story yeah, about her? Story. Okay, so, you know, we, I went to visit her and her old, it was her husband's lover who they met in Brazil in 1970. And then he ran away with them and never went back. He stayed with them till now. And uh, he, um, he took me there, Ilion, and... Uh, so we like snuck off in the nursing home and Judith Molina chain smoked joints like the whole time in the nursing home and, and was j railing uh, and still believed, you know, and I, I asked her how, you know, what, what, what she thought, what, what if she thought of the movements, what she thought of the revolution. And she said, well, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming any moment, it's coming. 
and uh, so she never quit. And in fact, she she eventually she made money. She was in some movies and stuff, and she put that all into the theater and lost it all. She never she never learned, you know. And so the question she never stabilized. Yeah, she never stabilized. So there's this kind of idea of of youth, and that we'll we'll learn better eventually, you know, and. Uh, and Judith never did, and she's a saint to me. She is, um, uh, uh, anyway, I won't talk about her too much, but. So these are things that we were looking at when we're working on this piece, and actually wondering, you know, we started working on this in very early 2013, um, no, 2014, yeah. um, pr pretty much realizing that we wanted to make a piece like this that did look at these radical moments. This is post-Occupy, or like kind of at the tail end of the Occupy movement, and the George Zimmerman trial had come, his verdict had come down, and it made me wonder, like, how can you sustain this? Where is this radical energy? What happened? How did we not make it? What, why did the group theater sell out? Like, why are, what happened to the Weather Underground? You know, um, can we train ourselves to be radical? That was a question that we were wondering. And, and also, too, it's the same time is that, that now on a totally different, um, Tack, we've been talking about the term radical really in terms of the radical 60s right now, but the, the language of radicalism is, is incredibly prevalent right now in the media, um, you know, speaking specifically of radical Islam, radical terror, and we wanted to understand what was, what was meant by those terms and also to understand uh, to, to try to empathize and understand well, what causes someone to commit a violent action. Uh, there's no, in any of the media portrayal of, of any of these acts that happen all the time, um, there's no sense of, of empathy or, or humanity. That we're, we are all people. These are people. We're people. And we, I'm, under the right circumstances, capable of committing violent action. You know, I am. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing different about me you know, other than my circumstances. So that's like the skill of the actor, is the idea to be able to empathize, empathize or to become someone other than yourself. And that your circumstances, the circumstances of the, of the play, um, you are, through those circumstances, you are trying to pursue a specific goal um, using a variety of tactics. And that, came into play in terms of um, structuring the piece. We refer, that's, that's um, so let me st start talking about the piece a little bit for those of you who saw it or who didn't see it. Um, uh, the piece starts out in an archive that um, we constructed. Um, and really influential in making this is this poem by Diane De Prima called Rant, where she talks about the idea that history is a living weapon in your hand and you have imagined it. It is thus that you find out for yourself. Um, and, you know, we wanted to give people the experience of having to select a certain amount of information, to be overwhelmed by information, much like these, um, you know, the graphic works that we were just talking about, and to um, spark a sense, well, to, to encourage a sense of investigation that, that one would then carry into the piece, and also to begin remembering either, you know, your own experiences in these eras or with these notions, and to talk to other people about them, so there's some semi-interactive um, elements to it, or you know the things that people would tell me were really interesting in these archives. And I, is in the archive. I'm in the archive, and I'm basically myself in the archive. So the, also that I'll add on to that that there's a sense of uh, that the archive and the experience of going through the archive um, it uh, recreates the the chaos of history in the way that we don't tell people really about it before people show up. So if somebody shows up right at eight, they get less time there. You know, then if somebody comes at 7.40 or something before the performance, they get quite a bit of time to, to peruse through the materials, to look, and whatever you happen, maybe you spend all your time in one box, or maybe you go through and you know quite a bit about that box, or maybe you 
only go through certain boxes. So the information that you're given is uh, different. The audience already is coming in with different experiences, but we try to heighten that difference and, and heighten the differences in their preparation through the archive to create um, conflicting interpretations of the material that they see based on what they happen upon in the archive. So there are certain moments, if you end up in the Antigone box, you might see quite a bit of Antigone in the performance. If you spent all of your time looking at the cert, uh, another white box. White radicals. Yeah, at, on the box on white radicals, then you might view, uh, view the whole thing as a critique of, um, of these middle class white radicals uh, who made up the Weather Underground. So I will say that these images are taken from our tour of the piece, and this is in Milwaukee. But when we do it in Detroit, we do it in our space, Playhouse, which is um, a two-story house that was renovated into be a, a rehearsal and performance space. And actually, the materials that we used to make the set ca came out of the house. And we take people into the basement to, to go through the archive, and we talk about it as uh, materials found when we were renovating the house, which is true in the sense that we found things while we were renovating, that we researched and found the materials while working on the house, but not that they necessarily came out of that particular I mean, it, house. It is also a lie. I mean, it's true, and it's also a lie. Right. So that... that which um, is what theater is, and that's the well, contract, yeah. and that's like kind of the last radicality that you can have with theater these days, is that you just take the truth I mean, because when, when did we start the performance and when, when does it start and when does it end, you know? So the performance actually starts when you decided to come to it, you know? So you, it, it does. You've started thinking about it. You've started forming your ideas about the performance. You've started, maybe you've read something about it. And so you're not walking in um, clear and empty. You're walking in with, uh, with all of these ideas already. So we accept that as a reality. And that when the audience steps in, the performances begin, and anything we do in that space is the space of the performance. So uh, it's really up to the audience to, to determine what, what they want to believe and what they don't. But I think the piece works really well in our house in the way that, you know, like the idea of an archive and from like the Greek sense of the word that as a, as a house that holds documents. And so it starts to take on um, another sense of the word. And the, the whole house, the whole space becomes an archive in the way that the body is an archive of knowledge and of different histories, of ancestral knowledge, of memories, of cultural memory. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and play a clip. So yeah. the piece starts off in an archive, and then um, through the materials in the archive, the person, character, myself, uh, am transformed and bring the audience into um, the a uh, kind of reenactment space of the townhouse bombing, but reset into a different, uh, into like a bungalow house context. So that's the clip I'm going to play right now. Hanging from the butcher's hook, okay? So okay. my sister did come out of the house and she screamed, Sister, they have hanged him. That's why he called out to us, and this is the part. Okay. Right? So give me the knife. Here, give me the knife so I can cut him down so we won't hang him. Mm -hmm. All right? So I can carry his body inside and bring him back to life. And then she says, Shit! to the left and I go inside and I check the stalls and I go into the second stall and I remove the ceiling tile closest to the wall and I slide the suitcase in horizontally and I exit the stall and I walk away. I exit the stall and I walk away. So you see a few things in here. One is the beginning of the piece, uh, which as the audience walks in and sort of lands in this very naturalistic scene, you know, in a way, and we're, we're actually, we don't 
um, typically work in a kind of naturalism. That's not our, our general aesthetic. But for this particular piece, looking at this, this history of, of the American method, uh, we, we felt we had to deal with naturalism in a certain kind of way. So uh, it kind of lands in this, this kind of naturalism, but then the bomb goes off and the piece you know, explodes more or less and, um, and then goes back through various uh, fragments of this, this history, real and imagined. So it's kind of you're seeing that, that fragmentation there and also seeing a bit of our own physical practice in the moment of the explosion, which uh, we have our... Um, our own kind of training practice, we call it, which is, uh, it's just a, it's, we go through a long process of working physically, uh, pushing ourselves physically as a way of engaging with material, as a way of engaging with each other, um, defining metaphor to the body. So this shaking um, that you see, this kind of trembling, shaking, burning, uh, uh, becomes a physical metaphor for us of this, um, of this moment in, in the townhouse. So there's the weather underground thread of the piece, which we return to the townhouse at various points before the bombing, or I say the townhouse, but it's you know a kind of yeah. a stand-in for the townhouse. Um, and then there's also this method acting thread that is a different kind of character um, that the piece starts, there's, um, cuts in the action that start to take place in a method acting class um, with two acting students. And through that, we start to meld into Antigone. Um, which, yeah, we didn't kind of talk, which is the kind of third po point, which we arrived at, one, because of the living theater, Judith Molina's version of Antigone, which they toured extensively, um, which is one of their main works. You know, of course, Paradise Now is like the, 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 big one, but Antigone was also a major work of theirs. And uh, so looking at specifically at that, that version of Antigone, but also as Antigone as a metaphor uh, and at, for radical action, and in the kind of simplest terms, all, all Antigone does uh, to, to break the law, and which condemns her to death, is to sprinkle a tiny bit of dirt on the body of her brother, who it's forbidden to bury. And what, what is the least one can do with the most drastic um, kind of uh, consequences. And so she's become um, a kind of a metaphor for uh, a certain kind of rebellion. She mentioned all, all sorts of people talk about her you know, in that way. And so we wanted, we wanted to understand uh, something about that figure also. Is it, is it warranted? Is this belief in Antigone as a, this radical figure warranted? Or was she actually self-interested uh, after all, it's her brother she's burying, not some other person on the street. You know, um, is it possible for us to be motivated to act um, outside of self-interest or the interest for our loved ones? Was it pride causing her to move? You know, what what, what was it? So, in terms of the text of the piece, um, we some of the text is original. This stuff from the townhouse and then some we're pulling from the Judith Molina translation of Antigone um, we reimagine some of that and the next uh, section I'm going to show from the piece uh, we take we it's sort of layering all three of these threads on top of each other so the um, there's sort of this method acting, or uh, maybe cartoon version of Marlon Brando method acting, uh, as shown by Richard, uh, layered with um, the story of Antigone, uh, specifically the scene where she's been caught for burying her brother, and she's speaking with her uncle. Creon. Creon. And the text from, my text is from... Uh, Bernadine Dorn and the Weather Underground organization's communiques, and Richard's text is a mix of Ronald Reagan, Post People's Park, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. uh, McCarthy. McCarthy, trials, yeah. Right? So it, it's like Mac the famous McCarthy uh, speech of um, enemies from within, uh, combined with um, kind of a series of Ronald Governor, you know, Ronald Reagan speeches. Uh, so looking at the figure of Antigone as Bernadine Dorn and, and Creon as these, um, these conservative political figures. 
I hope this is that good. Fucking don't making love and loading guns. That's where we are. And we know that the lines have been drawn, and it is my job to lead kids to revolution from behind enemy lines. See, that's what I said. That's what I always said about people like you. It's not the enemies from without we have to look out for. No, it's the enemies from within. It's not that people clamoring at our walls that will tear down this great nation. It's that people born within its very own walls. They're the ones who commit treason. And it's not even the underprivileged, is it? No, it's those who were born with every advantage this country has to offer. The best schools, the best jobs, the best houses. It's those who were born with silver spoons in their mouths. They're the ones who commit treason against the state. I don't know why I have to put up the trash left you in the name of free speech, huh? If there's going to be bloodshed, let it be now. The time for appeasement is over. You know how this ends, right? I knew from the beginning. A martyr. The monster state tightens the noose around his own neck. It's not going to happen that way. You're not going to die a hero. Okay. So uh, you can also see. Okay, we're kind of skipping around, huh? That's fine. Yeah. Um, so don't pay. The slides aren't in any order anymore, so we did away with that. Uh, so you can see a bit of the. Uh, it's this. Uh, of this family relationship to the kind of domestic space of the house and uh, parent-child relationship of the establishment and the, um, and the radical. And, but we also work with um, rational images. So for instance, uh, images that aren't connected to a kind of literal interpretation, and those are intentional uh, in the sense that we use the, the grass for instance, there, there's a kind of whole scene that happens before it when there's sausage and it's a whole thing. But uh, then this, this grass appears and, um, you know, we, you know I, we couldn't necessarily tell you what it means, but it's, a, it's a, an image that evokes something in us, that evokes um, a sadness or something. And it's also meant to disrupt the... Of interpreted powers of the audience. So um, with the archive, the audience is especially now in the performance looking for connections. They're looking to make meaning out of the images. And we, um, we add things into the performance that defy meaning, that are, are in a sense meaningless. Uh, but based on, on what the audience brings in, what they um, have read what they've kind of are working with interpretively that they assign meaning to it so they're able to create um, meaning and experiences out of out of the images in that way should I say anything about the living theater since this image is up <laughs> <laughs> well you know they're really they're important I don't know if it's so and then maybe we can't see the connection yet into uh, the only thing that actually really made it besides the Antigone translation that really made it in of the um, living theater was we spent a lot of time looking at um, Paradise Now and their amazing script <laughs> for Paradise Now or how they got to their script, which is this right here, um, which is one of the, my favorite documents that I've ever come across. Um, and the piece is actually really dated and kind of awful yeah, we, we thought about showing a video you know but it's just terrible. so terrible um it's like really embarrassing in that way that you look at something from the 60s and feel a little bit embarrassed about it not not don't not everything the wrong way. no no like, not people from you know but it, it's but there's something it's about like the way that they're um they make totem poles they're there's there's all sorts of things that like you just yeah. you look at and we're like we that we can't we can't see. relate to it they yeah. they make the south pole and they try to connect, uh, anyways. But this came from these amazing conversations and, and looking at the rung of good and evil, the rung of prayer, moving into teaching, the way, 
um, redemption, love, heaven and earth, God and man. And so what they had wanted to do with this piece, Paradise Now, which was in the 68, 69, um, and is the piece that Andrew showed an image from before that ended in people taking off, began and ended in people taking off their clothes and often ended in arrest, was um, they wanted to bring about paradise and give the audience a path to paradise. So that was in the back of our minds in making the piece, and but we were, I'm a little bit of a cynical person, so very it was, cynical I'm person. a very cynical person, so it was really hard to put that, we didn't get there in our piece, we sort of, you know, stayed with the bombing, uh, I'm just going to well, say something about that, okay. yeah, just about, because I think this is the, our embarrassment is, is something that's valuable, you know, and it's, uh, it, it, because that is also a kind of metaphor for our embarrassment with the living theater, which is our lineage as theater makers, as experimental theater makers. That is, they are our lineage. You know, we come from that. You know, and uh, that that kind of embarrassment is the same embarrassment in a way that the left and, and people in our generation of the left still have for um, the left of that period of the sixties and seventies. White, and white that, guilt also, yeah, well, I, I think, think, is a part of and that. And a sense of dis and a disappointment in our, ourselves, and also a disappointment in those who came before us. So, and I and I see the living theater. I think is that is that me? Is that who I am? You know, and that uh, and that and and then, but at the same time, I revere them. You know, <laughs> at the same time, as figures, as people, as revolutionaries. Um, so it's very it's complicated. Our really uh, it's a very complicated kind of relationship we have with them. Okay, I'm gonna skip some of these. I'm gonna skip. This is the this is the open is the theater. Open we don't know. We clean him and feed him, but there is no measure to what degree so, the mind imagines. Well, this is from uh, one of their pieces that was uh, that coincided with the piece of the the living theater. I've lost the beginning. I'm in the middle, knowing neither the end nor the beginning. I'm in the middle, coming from the beginning. I'll just let it. I'll just go on. Yeah, but I think it's important these two groups uh, existed no simultaneously, and although the living theater predated and outdated the open theater, um, but the the open theater is kind of a direct, uh, more direct connection to the group theater, and that they were exploring methods, methodologies uh, in, in the theater pretty seriously, whereas the, the living theater ultimately really became, um, uh, well, what their name implies, that they were... Uh, that they were living the theater they were trying to create, and it was actually the entire life of the theater themselves that was the kind of work of theater. And that's why I say like that the piece, like looking at Paradise Now, you're like, this was the thing, you know, this was the thing that was so powerful. And but no, it was not the thing. They were the thing, you know. They that they in fact were the living theater. That that their lives and choices and um, yeah, anyway. So we end the piece <laughs> with, um, uh, we go back to the bombing and... Um, uh, there's, a, there's a socialist pageant, yeah. And we almost get somewhere and then we don't, um, which is our cynicism for that period and for the left. But then we did actually end the piece with, um, there's a dialogue that's kind of a cross between uh, an interrogation or a, uh, a recounting of, but also a sort of acting exercise, a sort of method acting exercise of imagining. You know, when you're like working with a character, you end up imagining all these external circ the circumstances of the character, or how how are they in the future, how are they in the past, and so we have this series of of questions, of questions yeah. and imaginings, and it ends with how could it have gone differently? So how could the that in one version the bombing happens, in one version the bombing doesn't happen, in another version, um, the um, they steal you know FBI secrets, and there is some connection to a revolution that happens later. And so we the actual ending of the piece is a is a publication we did with um, Ben Gatos who is a locally based graphic designer um, and runs, the, runs a project called Good Good. He um, proposed, well we were at the 5th Estate 50th anniversary, he proposed us doing a publication. So we worked with people um, in a series of workshops about imagining utopias. 
So what event could have happened in that era? What event could have changed that could have brought about a utopian 1984? And so this publication takes place in a utopian 84, and it goes from the large that, you know, Jesse Jackson is elected president, is president in the 80s. With Ronald Reagan directing Gremlins instead. And um, simple things like Detroit has a public transit system. So it kind of like went from the large to the mundane. Yeah. And the paper never talks about what the revolution was because that's something that happened in the previous era. But it is it was a really good exercise for us, a good research for us in terms of being able to imagine something. So the piece really comes back to imagination and the, the radical imagination. What is the radical imagination? And that as a kind of fire that is central and that burned in the these, you know, in the lives of the revolutionaries and the radicals and the um, researchers and imaginers of the 60s and 70s. And that is what I think is the most beautiful and valuable thing from that era and looking at artifacts from that era is that kind of energy, the, the imagination. Yeah, well, and connecting back to the Diane de Prima quote that we talk about, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. Well, in one sense, that's absolutely not true. There's all kinds of wars that matter. Uh, but on the other sense, it, it, there's, there is a truth to it in that if we, if we cannot imagine a way forward, if we can't imagine a possible future, then we have no way to, to, to build it together. And, uh, you know, we, this, and this part and the end of the piece and this uh, publication was in a way to try to overcome this cynicism, to, to try to imagine something as being different. And we chose to look specifically at the past because it's hard to see our way forward. And, but we can look at the past and see what might have changed, you know, what could have happened differently. And as an imaginative exercise for us and other people that we worked with um, to, to discover tangible hope, not hope that things will get better generally. Not optimism, yeah. maybe. Yeah, not optimism. But a, a kind of... Um, hope based in uh, reality and what, what could happen, what could be achieved, and how things could, could go differently. So that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. So this invites our speakers, uh, presenters to the stage. We can do a little bit of Q&A um, with a little bit of time left. So um, please join us up here. Let's see if this is, oh good, it's on. <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of perfect because I, I was going to start, uh, kick off things and we all want to hear from the audience as well. Um, because they had two quotes. Since I saw the piece last night, it's kind of in front of mind. Um, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. I mean, you're right, yeah, there's other battles to be fought, but this one uh, stuck out for me because in the context of the exhibition, one of the arguments I try to make is that um, one of the reasons that a lot of the projects are so sticky or so um, for us now um, and over time is because they're actually visualizations. They're visualizations for the future that could be um, with enactments of what could po what life could possibly be like within the kind of bubbles of the commune, of the community, of the neighborhood. Um, so there's always kind of physical limit and a kind of temporal limit um, to what could be imagined. But um, and uh, the other important quote, I think, from the piece is that um, you have to believe that though the script has been written, it could change, right? And that's kind of the, the way out from the production. I mean, if thinking about the production in terms of if it's not about optimism, then what is it really about? And I'm wondering if any of our panelists would like to tackle the notion about um, how do we view um, the kind of actions and events at that moment in terms of what um, is possible today and what we're seeing today. I know that Esther spent a long time trying to, you know, connect up the past and the present in terms of what we we're thinking in terms of practice. But if you had any thoughts about how um, present day events are being enacted, maybe in similar ways or in a different way, but based on that kind of history. 
there's just a lot of social movements, for example, that are a lot of parallels that we're seeing. Um, Black Lives Matter, for instance, um, Occupy Wall Street um, is another kind of good earlier uh, precursor to the kinds of um, staging of a kind of visualization about protest and the imagination. Is there any things from your talk or from <laughs> your inventory of knowledge that might be resonant in that? Well, I just wanted to make the comment that when the first time, and I was lucky enough to see this show at the Walker, when I saw the overall you know, set of things that had been um, chosen to uh, put, be put together, I realized that we were looking at work that all had to do with the very, you know, problems that all these years later are still actually an open question and unsolved. Only we're looking at people who didn't have like the cynicism or the upset of 40 years of unfulfilled uh, or uh, what seem like blockades to that imagination, um, you know, occurring. And so to say today as, you know, I mean, the other night in the 2D department, a student made an incredibly impassioned argument for dealing with the issues of today, but they, they seem so massive and, and unbelievable. And if you look at that work from the late 60s and early 70s, you do see people referring them to them already as almost unmanageable or you know, as if things are in a state of emergency. But there's this ability to be projective and, and imagine a way out of it that isn't science fiction, like not over, well, I guess some of it could be. But um, anyway, that, so that kind of time, the time loop in, in the way that these works reflect upon the present day, I think is pretty intense. Um, I think there's an interesting resonance um, with the ideas that are in the show and a lot of the conversations that are arising in regards specifically to post-internet art. Um, primarily, and I think um, you know, other fields like architecture have been very slow to um, enter that conversation, but what I think is really interesting is that the tool sets are, um, are basically laterally placed. I mean, everyone has access to the same software, same tool sets, same communication networks. Um, so this is to say, I think one of the one of the strange kind of dichotomies around, I guess, life after the internet is that one sense of scale is sort of obliterated, right? Things, um, you know, things that are very far away are very immediately within your grasp, but at the same time, things that are very, very uh, close in some ways seem very far, right? Um, and I was thinking to myself actually this morning that maybe that. Um, kind of parallax that we're experiencing and maybe the kind of impetus around, I mean, I used to live in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, so, you know, it's like everything's like local and artisanal and slow and, and, and I was wondering if part of that impulse is actually um, not specifically endemic to the, the rise of the internet, but actually um, just a kind of exacerbated condition that always existed, right? Like, if that makes sense. So, um, this is to say, I think that there seems to be a shift in thinking, in, in terms of thinking about scale and, and locality and temporality. That there is a way in which I think a lot of young practitioners are starting to address questions of change and urgency through very small scale interventions. So if we look at, I mean, they won the Turner Prize this year, Assemble, an architectural collective. Uh, very kind of with very humble means, we're able to achieve um, very profound projects. And um, but it's it's always at a scale of building that is a kit of parts. It's very accessible. It's built by people that aren't experts, and it's achievable with arts council funding and this and with resources that are available. I mean, they pillage the construction sites of big corporate jobs and take the leftovers and reuse that. And I think that there's a kind of entrepreneurialism in there that is. Um, I'm hopeful <laughs> is uh, will only grow with them, and I think is in some ways also a response to this post-internet moment. So that's my long response, but yeah. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> Anything to say? Uh, no, I got nothing. 
Well, I just wanted to add that the, you know, the old slogan, you know, think globally and act locally, at, a, at the time the slogan was invented, I think you had to think locally. You had to start there. Now the local is a choice. Right. And, and it's a really different thing, but it's almost a kind of discipline of looking local to try to open up the imagination, <laughs> it seems to me, and observing the kinds of efforts you're describing. Thanks. Um, I think one of the key questions is probably what you know what constitutes radicality. Um, you got Esther got at least a little bit versus criticality, um, which we hear a lot about in let's say design discourse or um, artistic practice uh, today. But um, you know, I was wondering if you know, reflecting on your presentations, what are those elements of of radicality that could be um, that you can you know kind of point to? Um, I know I had a difficult time trying to. Um, and the thesis of the exhibition discussed, um, talk about what a radical aesthetics was. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of came to the conclusion it's really, because um, we often think of aesthetics as being about this, or this is the way it is, or this is the way it seems or looks, um, to be about a kind of, to be an aesthetics of refusal about what, what it's not going to be, a, a rejection of a certain kind of practice, a rejection of a certain kind of disciplinary boundary, um, rejection of uh, one's place in society. So it's a, it's a kind of anti-aesthetics in a way, or it pre, pre, presupposes what we call anti-aesthetics later in another thing called postmodernism or a little later in postmodernism. But I'm wondering in the examples that you showed or in the work, what do you think constitutes the, the radical or the, maybe the radicant, but I'm still processing <laughs> that. No, no, <laughs> anyway. I'll do it. Sure, I'll say it. Um, well, I mean, in terms of, well, I think this is going back to the, this is going back to the, um, why we chose to look at the living theater and their production of Paradise Now in that, um, in that moment, the aesthetics were absolutely uh, radical and that that was, uh, it, in a way that's hard to imagine in the sense that, that there was a, Okay, so what, like, in terms of the, like, what is the effect? You know, so in this sense, the, the effect were, were riots. You know, the effect was um, like actual upheaval in the response to a performance, which is hard for us to imagine right now. You know, it's hard to imagine that happening um, at that kind of level and scale. Uh, so what? They, they invented the they invented the crowd um, surfing, like the, stage dive. the stage dive in that piece, and uh, Jim Morrison saw it in in San Francisco. And they had a stage dive in the piece, and then he started doing it the next night at a show. So I mean, they were they were really looking at how to break down the boundaries between audience and performer in these ways, and and it's interesting you're talking about not being critical, but in a sense, I think they were pretty in intentional ab about it in the sense that they were really trying to well, what are the structures of the theater, and then how can those be stripped away and and, and broken down, and so I think. Uh, there, there's a tendency to think of like that a kind of radical art is only like responsive and kind of immediate, uh, but I, I don't I don't think that's necessarily true. That there can be a, a, a like a, a quality of it being considered of seeing well what is what are the structures right now? What what are the structures that are um, are holding us back, and how can those be broken down? Like and and broken down strategically. Um, that, I mean, that would be like, a, a, it, it's not a, like, it, and that would be different depending on the discipline, different depending on the, uh, what we're looking at. But I think there's, there's a sense of that if, if we're, if, um, if that's, if the goal is to try to, to break through, to try to uproot, to pull up from the roots, um, to understand what it is, what is the thing that we're pulling up. I guess, you know, it's interesting because as you were talking, I was thinking about how in graphic design, um, you know, there are a set of really large conditions that have affected everybody's progress, uh, process. And one of them is that we live within the Adobe Creative Suite, <laughs> you know, InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator. And, um, and yet it's attached to this 
a gigantic system of data and the internet linked world and you know it, it and then the other thing is that we're kind of living in a time where global capital is just you know bigger and bigger and so you know the kind kind of combination of a set of systems that you often feel you're, are bigger than you and, and you're at their, uh, at their mercy, um, I think sits over everybody. It doesn't take you too long to realize that. And so it is back to kind of radical imagination or trying to imagine ways out of either a kind of preconceived language or even a preconceived situation of distribution. And so, you know, it seems to me at least one thing I've observed as a as a designer who works with young designers is that the return of people wanting to be the authors of their content and to take some kind of control and then that slams you into the distribution and the printing system. I mean, I know this weekend is the Detroit Book Fair and I think just events like that are new, but they actually, and on one hand you can say, oh, it's a bunch of people selling books, great. But it actually represents a kind of attempt to, um, to to get away from the larger, you know, market forces. So there is a kind of desperation to reach independence, it seems to me, in many of these efforts that are going on now. And it, it's kind of, but more I think now, it's testing the limits of people's imagination given the complexity of the problems, you know, that, and that of course leads, I think, or should lead to back to the logic of the, um, collaborative efforts and communal work and projects where you are marshalling more than one set of talents to tackle, tackle a project. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard in that single artist or single creator model to take these things on, but, right. you know, there's this other, other model of finding the person who knows how to code or to do whatever to break through many of these things that actually start to feel pretty oppressive. Right, and it would allow you to, it would, it would allow you to scale up to yeah. kind of uh, go against the scale problem. I wanted to open it up for some questions. If we have questions, um, still thinking? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll repeat them if you can, yeah, if we need to. Um, I mean, there's two sort of areas. Richard started to talk about this physical metaphor, and um, um, the other, another area that we that we work with physically in this piece in particular was with reenactment or like, and we've worked in this way in the past to like reenact these moments, and we also reenact a, a living theater performance that is very obscure that they did in Brazil. There was a Mother's Day pageant where they tied the mothers to the kids with crepe paper, and the kids jumped off the stage to break the bo the fascist bond between mother and child as a way <laughs> to explore the break. Can you a little background, real quick. Okay. Real fast. Well, they they were commissioned to make a Mother's Day play. They were broke in Brazil, and this like town town paid them to make a Mother's Day play. And so they ended up making it about the um, about capitalism and sadomasochism. Yeah, and and the bond and the the parent state and the child. And uh, anyway, they got arrested. So. 1971. So, but reenacting that to find what is radical about that, and that was less of a like a physically demanding thing that we were looking at. But can I, you know, if we are looking at method acting and this idea of becoming and um, to take action, then then from an acting standpoint, can I inhabit this moment in the past? Because you can't. It's just 
doing historical research is always so strange in black and white photos and the world wasn't black and white and touching paper is, paper from the time is, is that's really special but now it's older paper. So h what are ways that you can inhabit history and I think reenactment at least in working on this piece, was a way to try to inhabit these people at that particular time. Do you want to talk about the physical metaphor at all? Yeah, I mean, what, I mean, we we the 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 training. What we talk about training, we're really pushing our we pushing our bodies pretty far. You know, we'll we'll do a very like uh, physically demanding actions for hours and hours until we're basically completely exhausted. Um, and then from that point of total exhaustion, we'll start to improvise in sort of small ways. And those improvisations become the foundation for certain sections of the performance. So like the Antigone sections of the performance really came out of this, come out of this training place. And while we train, we train with certain questions. And there's a little, in the, even, I love the section of Antigone you play in the basement on that says, you know, we are the tribe that asks questions and we ask them to the bitter end. And that's something we, hold dear and that we're not proposing answers and we don't, our process is not one of answers, it's one of, of questions in the sense that we, um, we try to place ourselves into spaces of not knowing, places of imbalance. Uh, and we try to do that actually, actually working with imbalance, so you know, actually working with being off balance physically. Um, what, what, is it if, what is it to be in that place between standing and falling? Uh, what is it to burn? What, like, what is it to actually burn? Like, what would that be? And how, how to find that in the in the body? And uh, those kinds of kind of physical researches for um, how do we actually uproot something? You know, if we're looking at the word radical, and how what does rootedness mean? You know, and then what is it? it what is it? What happens to physically pull it up? You know, so those those are the kinds of things we'll work with and in the training and to try to embody in a physical way. Thanks. We have uh, other questions. We can ask. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want that? Well, only to make a comment that um, if you look at the trajectory of ideas in graphic design. And I'm sorry, one other thing, the whole radical idea, and I'm sorry. Radical, like blowing up the type, and I, I, it's radical itself. But then again, radical becomes cool and gets repackaged as being, you know, is that just. Oh yeah, no, the commercial cycle is speedier than ever and there's no stopping it. Um, I guess all I wanted to say is that, that uh, actually in a very real parallel to what Esther described connected to the period where architecture becomes looked at as a humanity and kind of through the lens of, of um, a whole set of critical theories that were very, very language-based, you know, that there is um, 
you know, there's a theory that, and I'll just throw out, like if you look at uh, Rick Pointer's book called No More Rules about postmodern graphic design in the 80s and 90s, he basically ascribes all the formal experimentation of that period to either reacting to language theory, and it was. I mean, there was a lot of talk about it at schools here being one of the, um, the places. So language theory, and then the kind of either the um, palpable onset of digital technology or finally its, its arrival. You know, that suddenly you, the designer again, in this kind of pre-modern way is setting their own type. Uh, I mean, the diggers were setting their own type too, but on these crappy selectrics where all they, in a weird way, you could probably say, well, you get a justified column and you just make it to fit the space and that's how you fill it. However, they did have enough text and more to fill every bloody centimeter on the page. So the the thing about the, what I always find weird and, and um, unsatisfying about that description of the 80s and 90s is that, first of all, it does ignore the older, the history right before that, and it's too instrumentalized, like it doesn't, it doesn't allow for intentionality. And it also treats, it has a tendency to treat it all really formally, which is what has allowed then people to go, oh, and I'm sick of that deconstructed type, so I'm gonna bring back Helvetica, I'm, I love it so much, I'm gonna make a movie about it. You know, it, so it's, it's a kind of emptying out to me of graphic design when it's only looked at as a kind of formalized practice. And so what I find so interesting, again, about this period is, you're right, the formal aspects of it are awful. <laughs> you know, I mean, talk about embarrassment. You know, there's a lot of stuff in it that's just terrible. Um, but terribly, terrible in a really interesting way. And then you have to go back to, well, what were the intentions? What are, what's being done here? So to me, it, again, reopens an old lens and weirdly enough, it's all about the function of the piece and the audience for the piece. The 80s and 90s were a totally important period where graphic designers kind of had to become their own authors. And they did it first, I think, through that formal set of formal means. But there was that older history sitting there. So that's my response to your statement. <laughs> I, I guess I would leave you with three concepts and not really answer, I guess, but like critical versus radical versus experimental. I think there's overlaps between those three words, but there's um, trajectories within that are separate. So like a lot of 90s work is characterized as experimental, a lot of 60s work is considered radical, and a lot of today's work is considered critical, progressive work um, in those camps. And it's interesting how we pick those words to describe you know, their conditions of their, how, they, how they emerge and then how they're interpreted. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, any other questions from the audience? Well, I'm, I guess my only thought about it is that the mere kind of questioning a, a, or, or the attempt to get around the mainstream distribution media, uh, you know, that, that that's there. But I agree with you. It's not particularly political, and it, although it could be, you know, so, and it could be more easily than if you went and tried to sell it to uh, Harper and Rowe or, you know, some mainstream publisher. So it, it's kind of, 
suddenly it's there again and there for the, you know, ripe for the taking. Yeah, it could be like political and lowercase p yeah. reacting within the space that it's allowed to react in as an alternative market, um, as opposed to, you know, utterly transformative <laughs> social paradigm politic, big uh, uppercase P it would be <laughs> what I think about it, at least. But definitely politics, uh, they're woven through, and that's the radical, like the notion of radical aesthetics, of the introduction of politics within theater, the introduction of politics within just culture at large, um, which then, of course, gets played out in the 1980s in a different way in the culture wars. Like, the culture wars really emanate from this time period. It's just they were on a delay till Reagan arrives at the White House, I guess. <laughs> instead of directing gremlins. <laughs> yes, in the back. I mean, I think live events are political in that we don't have a lot of opportunities to gather together. And so for us, the reason that despite me hating theater, I really hate it, I like doing it because it is, um, it's communal. I mean, and there are different ways to allow people to be themselves in a theatrical event and not necessarily submit to rules, but there's also something that is ceremonial about it and, and that we don't literally have a lot of public space in, I mean, in Detroit, in my neighborhood in particular, there aren't a lot of public spaces. There's a, a park and, you know, the sidewalks. But, um, so to create those kind of opportunities, I do think is useful in not necessarily what happens within the space, but what happens um, outside of it. And we're in a very different circumstances than the people who we were looking at within our research, where I think we were, we did have more opportunities to be together. Our theater wasn't so bougie. Maybe it was bougie too, but like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I would also just say that, I mean, I think that uh, uh, just briefly for us, I mean, I, I never, um, thought I'd be making um, like political theater, you know, in the sense, and that that wasn't ever the in, in, an intention, you know, and in the sense that this piece, the radicalization process really, you know, was uh, researching these political movements and not, I still don't think it's necessarily a piece of political theater, you know, in that sense, but our, but our next w work is going to be, you know, and I think there's something of the, um, this doesn't directly uh, respond, but there's something about like, by looking at these things and trying to, and trying to respond to um, what I am bombarded with all the time, you know, by the internet, you know, the the next the next piece is actually will have an element that is takes place on the internet and that is actually trying to achieve something directly politically, you know, and um, which well, we won't talk too much about right now, but it, I think there's. Um, I don't know. I think there's 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 ways of adapting and, and actually do, doing something politically with with art making still. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I'm going to string together a couple uh, different comments, but I think um, there's a tendency to think about politics or political action with as being anti institutional, and I would say that. I don't think that's how politics operates today, at least not for me. I mean, I'm certainly a product of many institutions. <laughs> I'm incredibly institutional in that sense, but I do think that, so I think that there's a different model of um, activism where 
you know, you can still be a, an educator in a university, but still see your role as an educator as inherently political. Um, I choose to I choose to talk about certain kinds of art and architecture um, over others. I choose to put certain people on my syllabus over others. I develop a new canon for my students as opposed to you know what I was maybe taught. I mean, those are all choices that I think are inherently political. And so I think that the texture of politicism is um, it's a different thing. I think it operates at a different scale, but I think it always comes back to the ethics of how one does whatever one does in life, regardless of what discipline you're in. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, I think the questions you raise around um, how, to, how to act in a politicized way in relation to the internet is a question that Seth Price, an artist, rose, uh, you know, actually um, put forth in his manifesto in like the early 2000s called Dispersion, which you can actually download for free and I would really encourage you to do it. And, and he basically starts to observe a kind of new economy of image making with the prevalence of JPEGs that circulate in the world and how do we as artists not necessarily um, cut ourselves off from this particular mode of circulation but actually work within it. And, and I think it's a, a, you know, again, if we think about radicalism versus criticality, he is inherently radical in his proposition, which is that there's always an operative development, uh, an operative element to what he's suggesting, as opposed to uh, strictly an analysis of an existing condition, right? There's always a strategy for moving forward. And I think one of the things he suggests is that there, again, it comes to a question of kind of management, like how do we manage a kind of economy of images, that, an economy of information? How do we you know, what filters do we use, you know? Um, and David Jocelyn, an art, art historian, has also written a lot about that. And I think, so I think your question's really, you know, apt, and I think, um, this is a long response, but I, uh, but I, there are, I think there are a lot of ways of navigating it, but I wouldn't necessarily discredit um, certain forms of, you know, what, certain forms of action as being apolitical because it doesn't look like the forms that came before it. Uh, maybe a last question, or we could bring it to a close, and we can you can interact with us in person down here. Thank you so much for sticking with us. <laughs> Thank you to the speakers too.